I V M. Before we move on with this episode of the Scene in the Unseen, do check out another awesome podcast from IVM Podcast, Cyrus Says, hosted by my old buddy Cyrus Brocha. How should we treat other people? How should we behave in society? When I first started thinking about this seriously, I was drawn to the second formulation of Kant's categorical imperative: never treat another person as a means to an end, but as an end in themselves. That is, respect every individual's autonomy and agency. Don't think what use they can be to you. Now, this is obviously easier said than done, and might even be impossible. There is a natural limit to how many people we can regard as worthy of our moral consideration, and our relationship with everyone else is transactional. We try to get as much out of them as we can, as if we are at a sabzi mandi and driving the hardest bargain. Maybe we are driven purely by biological instincts, and all our so-called civilized behavior is just a performative veneer. Even if that is so, I would say that in this case, performative is a good thing. If all of us even pretended to respect other people and not treat them as a means to an end, the world would be a better kind of place. But we couldn't be further away from this. One of the things that the Me Too movement makes clear is that men always treated women as a means to an end. This includes women who are strangers, women at our workplace, women who are friends, even women in our families. And I'm not just talking about the obvious illustrations of this, of using women for sex or as live-in housemates. In a million insidious ways, women are treated as second-class citizens, diminished in countless ways, constantly shown their place, and this is so normalized that we take it for granted and we don't even question our behavior. That's why, for me, Me Too is so important. It puts this behavior in the spotlight. Not just obvious crimes like sexual assault, but casual, everyday sexism that is reflexive to all men, including me. This is the most important cultural moment of our lifetimes, and I believe that despite all the turmoil now, in fact, because of all the turmoil, it will make the world a better place. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. My guests for today's episodes are two remarkable journalists, Supriya Nair and Nikita Saxena. Despite my brief rant in the intro, I promise I'll spend most of this episode shutting up and just listening to them, as I think most men should do. To briefly introduce my guests, Supriya Nair is uh, a journalist I've known for a while. Uh, welcome to the show, Supriya. Hi, thank you for having me, Amit. Nikita Saxena works at the independent magazine The Caravan, and a couple of years ago wrote a brilliant long read report for them about R. K. Pachauri. Um, Welcome to the show, Nikita. Thank you for having me, Nikita. I want to start this episode by talking about that report of yours. But before we begin, let's take a quick commercial break. Like me, are you someone who loves fine art but can't really afford to have paintings by the artists you like hanging on your walls? Well, worry no more. Head on over to IndianColors. dot com. Indian Colors is a company that licenses images of the finest modern art from some of the best artists in India and adapts them into objects of everyday use. These include wearable art like stoles and shrugs, home decor like cushion covers and table runners, and accessories like tote bags. This allows art lovers to actually get fine art into their homes at an accessible price, and artists get royalties on sales, just like authors do. What's more, Indian Colors now has an exciting range of new products, including fridge magnets with some stunning motifs, and salad bowls and platters made of mango wood. Their artists include luminaries like Babu Xavier, Vasvo X Vasvo, Brinda Miller, Dilip Sharma, Shruti Nelson, and Pradeep Mishra. They accept bulk orders for corporate and festival gifting, but even if you want to buy just for yourself or a friend, head on over to IndianColors.com. That's colors with an O U. And if you want a twenty percent discount, apply the code IVM twenty. That's I V M for IVM podcast. I V M twenty for a twenty percent discount at IndianColors. dot com. Welcome back to the scene in the unseen. I am with Shupriya Nair and Nikita Saxena. Uh, Nikita, I loved your report on Pachauri when it Thank first you. came out, and when I was reading um, uh, reading it again today morning, it struck me that much of what you describe in that story is universally true of our culture. The work environment where sexism is normalized, the persistent patterns of psychological and emotional manipulation, as you put it, the gaslighting of the victims, where they are made to feel as if there is something wrong with them and they are overreacting, the act of victimhood by the accused when they are confronted with their actions, the use and misuse of power, which proves a dictum that power always corrupts. What was it like reporting on the story for you as all these layers revealed themselves? Um. 
so the story initially had sort of taken form at the time um that the case that one of the survivors had filed in 2015 Uh, sort of started getting attention and Raghav Ori who was the journalist from Economic Times who broke the story had doggedly been following it and the idea initially was just to see in a short report what this journey for someone who tried to take recourse through due process looked like um i think by day 2 we had a sense that we were actually looking at a way larger story and for me uh I think you uh, really do not anticipate the kind of challenges you're going to be facing on reporting a story that has such direct repercussions for you. Um because as a woman to be reporting on multiple stories of sexual harassment also meant for me that I was revisiting a lot of my professional and personal experiences that I had for the longest time kept buried uh which was not comfortable at all. But in a way it also meant that with each interview i was privileged with information and insight that i did not have earlier that also helped me navigate this space on my own and i'd like to think that i was able to use that insight to report the story uh better uh the other thing was just the sheer repeated like the just the other thing was just the repetitions in patterns to the point that it was almost banal you know and that was what surprised me after a point because i remember sitting when i was just going to start writing i sat with all the transcripts of my interviews and i'd done multiple interviews and after a while all of it on my desk started looking the same because he was following the same pattern with all of these women it could have been at different points of time they could have been different ways to enter uh, the equation but largely when you sort of looked at it from the top it didn't look very different so you know one of the things was for example the young women that he chose to prey on or women who were coming from situations that would make them perceivably more vulnerable um so to kind of make use of the insecurities that professional women are anyway coming in with at any office and this is something i think about often that it so happened that the story was of terry but the idea that men who make sexist jokes who are known to make uh what they loosely call passes at women which is such a trivialization of what actually happens we all know those people in our offices and we all know men who condone those jokes and we all have been complicit in not supporting women who may have wanted to come out with these complaints earlier and i think that's a larger problem not just a terry problem to come back to pachori i mean uh you know so one was that you would see that there were a lot of young women that he decided to act as a mentor to and for me that was personally the most corrupting part of it right because all of these women would enter into their interactions with him believing that they're being approached because of their intellect or because of what they bring to the organization and then to be dehumanized at the point that you realize that it is all so that this man can approach you uh, with you know an a sexual intent or a gendered intent i think to be to be listening to the recollection of that was the hardest because uh, that betrayal of trust or the betrayal of the idea that you were worthy of the attention intellectual and professional of a man who you deeply admired um isn't comparable and that's the part sorry that i think we tend to overlook when we're talking about sexual harassment it's not just the physical um you know it's not just the physical transgressions it's also the um the breaking of the uh, confidence of a woman trying to reinforce the idea that you are always going to be your gender oh uh, sorry supriya i think you were i had a question can you tell us how many women you spoke to approximately through the course of the story so i spoke to about 50 to 60 people for the story in its entirety and apart from three women including the main complainant who had already put out their versions either through a legal complaint or through open letters i spoke to six women uh, who were survivors and this was over the course of the 30 years that terry had started so the oldest employee so to speak that i spoke to was someone who worked in terry in the early 90s um so we're also talking about something that was allowed to continue mm. for very long for way longer than it should have and the kind of 
devastation that this leaves the women with um you know so for example i remember one woman telling me that she went into another office uh, after she left teddy and she remembered immediately noticing that there are a lot of women in that office and that the boss is male and she said i was immediately distrustful and as it turned out later there was no reason for her to feel that way but that's how the alarms went up because that's what had been conditioned into her after her time at terry and so much of it was so textbook right so he would um you know tell the women about how smart they were how far he wanted to see them go uh then he would start talking to them about his marriage and there would be conversations about how it was failing uh, you know how he did he was not comfortable with the kind of equation he had with his wife and it was a big decision for me to think over whether or not i wanted to put it into the story because on some level it does feel unfair to me that almost always we tend to put the spotlight on the women associated with men which is not to say that it's not justified but um sometimes we tend to put that spotlight more on the women than the accused themselves but it seems so intrinsic to his modus operandi and i remember reading his book this uh, terrible book called <laughs> return to almora uh, which got really famous for its uh, i mean it was talked about a lot because it has a lot of very badly written sex scenes but that part is actually the least interesting part of the book um i think he meant for it to be autobiographical semi autobiographical in nature that's the sense one gets as a reader and there are parts of the book in which he's almost describing the modus operandi to you because uh, there's an instance in which the protagonist you know fleeting love interest who makes an appearance in and out of the book has fallen in love with an older man and there is a an entire paragraph that i remember reading in which pachori has written about how this older man had probably gotten her uh, you know this naive young girl to fall for his advances because he gave her the same tired old story about a broken marriage and at this point i know what he's done with the survivors themselves and i thought it was uh, almost revoltingly self aware you know and so there was that then he would isolate them and that's again so dangerous because you're basically consciously cutting off channels for these women to reach out to if i don't have colleagues i can trust if i'm constantly being told that you know everyone out here is not looking for your well-being but i am you're also making sure that these women are going to ask themselves 10 times more whether or not they want to alienate the only supposed ally who also happens to be the boss of this organization who also happens to be the chair of the IPCC that has won a nobel under him do i really want to cross paths with him and maybe i'm getting this all wrong because you know he's been looking out for me this entire time and that's when he would move into the territory of using this amplified vulnerability to justify his abhorrent actions either the verbal comments he made or the kind of physical advances he thought it was kosher to make by this time even if the women are sure and they know what's happening you're also aware of the power of this man you've kind of seen it through the course of the grooming that he's put you through in some cases he would ask to meet their parents you know and one woman said that i was sure he did this to give me the sense that if i can't even talk to my parents then you know where am i going to go and that is uh, grooming is something that you know uh, people who are child abusers do with children so that the children do not feel comfortable to confiding in their parents about the, their experiences and then of course there were the threats there was the there were decisions to take away work there was the demeaning of the women's professional abilities the uh, objectification of them as women who invited this upon themselves and this is again a really interesting defense that i see with especially men in positions of power who decide to sexually harass women you made me do this i can't take control of my feelings because you just you know you've i i you kind of put the responsibility back on the woman for how she has um, filled you with passion that you didn't know existed i mean it's part of a template but uh, you know the women are made to feel like this is a unique case and somehow they are to blame for it because they're you know you were just so beautiful that i didn't know what else root has never happened to me before and now because these women are not speaking to each other because that's the structure you've consciously created in most cases they're not even sure that this is a part of a template 
or even if they could have some idea they don't know if they are going to be able to confirm that suspicion and then also comes the part about you know playing up both what you could bring to their life the havoc they are creating supposedly on your life and what you could do to them if they do decide to speak out and this is said in insidious ways right and the funniest part for me in a very bizarre way of all of this was that finally after i was done reporting a few days before the story went to press i did end up meeting mr pachauri and i felt like i was meeting someone i knew already you know because i'd just been thinking about him for so long and there were things that i knew he did with other women that i saw him doing with me and i was a journalist he knew that he was talking to me on the record i had a recorder switched on in his presence and i remember that the minute i sat down uh, and there was a photographer who was with me um he said oh, before we start the interview can i just can i ask you something naughty and i just thought that was fantastic because how can you be so audacious you know i mean and after which for example there were these things he would do where he, this was also a man who was obsessed with the idea of power very much like a lot of men that we know in these positions and one of the projections of that was to talk often about his cricketing prowess as a way to talk about his virility um or he had this very strange habit of getting back toiletries uh, from his trips abroad which people in terry would go to collect because that was the kind of cult he had created during our interview at some point he did start talking about his cricketing ability he didn't ask you any naughty questions you mentioned the naughty question was what pranoy roy's uh, reaction to the ndtv story was which i thought was quite boring i mean it was not naughty at all you were disappointed yeah i i mean i wasn't disappointed i just thought that i'm talking to someone who really lacks in awareness about how they are to conduct themselves considering he had a very very public sexual harassment case been filed against him because of which he had lost professional opportunities um i don't know if it was the lack of self awareness it just sounds like a marvelous confidence it is it is and i think just the idea that you can get away with this because you've been getting away with it for so long you can't envisage a scenario within which you will not i mean think about it someone who's done this for 30 years <clears throat> this is behavior i mean this is this is your nature now you don't know how else to be i think and, and what i found as disturbing in your account as these patterns of behavior is the fact of how other people looked upon them for example you've quoted someone talking about him and talking about mr pachauri and saying oh wo to rangile mesaj ke aadmi hai uh, you know and and they'll talk about uh, him affectionately and how he plays the field and he has a roving eye and all that as if all of that is okay and it's standard and that's what you expect and kind of and i i imagine at some level like what is dis- disturbing is that these patterns of behavior were probably known to a lot of his colleagues and they didn't find it wrong and perhaps therefore he had the confidence to behave like uh, that even when you went to interview him because he didn't find it problematic either i wonder if that's true of the reactions of a lot of men who are watching what is happening in these days and weeks uh, and who sense that something big is going on but aren't quite able to understand why I think even more than the hashtag me too why women are saying times up I don't think anybody gets that there's a ticking clock um and I mean maybe you know something about this because uh you occupy spaces that Nikita and I by virtue of our gender don't necessarily do um and I I really want to ask you and Nikita uh, I want to talk about what what men are thinking at, at this time I think many men are shaken up but most men are largely in denial it's it's almost as if hey women are overreacting what's a big deal and people will point out again a point that I'll bring up later about that hey there's a spectrum of abuse and some people are assaulters but a lot of these are bad dates or somebody cracking a bad joke on a date and my point and this is not a view I would have held I think 10 days ago hmm. but my point I I think one realization that I'm coming to is that this me too movement is not about the sexual assaults or crossing clear lines of consent everyone agrees that is wrong it's about patterns of sexism in our behavior which are so normalized that we don't even know like the classic example of that would be if you're in a mixed group 
making jokes with sexual innuendos which are perfectly fine and then gaslighting the women if uh, uh, if somebody protests and saying oh you know you are too sensitive and all of that and one thing i've realized and i i, I did an um, episode uh, with the three of the women who work at takshashila a couple of weeks back on the matrix of empowerment how can we figure out how women are getting empowered and one revelation that kind of came up there was that every single moment of my life my maleness doesn't matter to me i take my gender for granted it is not a factor in how i interact with people it's the exact other way around for women mm-hmm. every single moment of your time as a woman your gender is a factor you're getting onto a local train you're getting into a restaurant you're talking with a man in a cafe it is a factor and therefore this makes it imperative on men to make sure that they are cognizant of this and therefore that they make that extra effort and apply that filter to make sure that women are not uncomfortable in any way in their presence which could be something as simple as making sure that you change the kind of humor that you do in mix company which could be something as um, sort of simple as say for example uh, you know as a middle aged man i i i grew up in the 80s and the 90s and all of that and uh, the norms of how you greet women have changed earlier you would just nod or some circles do a namaste then you shook hands now you hug and all of that which i found very awkward to navigate so the best solution i think for any man in that case is if you're meeting a woman in a social setting uh just let her make the first move you know just go with that just i mean th- this sounds very uh, sort of masculine but uh, think of it as a game theory problem that i will optimize my behavior in such a way that the chance of the woman feeling uncomfortable is uh, minimized and this is something that i don't uh, think men get that they behave in ways they think are normal uh, and they don't understand the reactions of women why are you laughing I don't think game theory is masculine. <laughs> no, I mean uh, I know that that see this is I <laughs> I'm also uh, not I also sure. sorry I also noticed that see. even though Amit and I have known each other for years today he waited for me to hug him. Ah. Uh, <laughs> thank you Amit I appreciate that. Uh and I also appreciate what you're saying. I realize that uh behavioral boundaries change and that it's uh, as difficult for men to navigate as women in many ways. Uh but one of the things i think many of us uh, have realized or under underscored for ourselves in the last few days uh, is that women have to bear the brunt of that to an unimaginable extent and uh, one of the things that frustrates me is that the sort of radical empathy that this confessions and this discourse is generating among women for each other doesn't seem to have reached men and i feel like the onus is on on men to if you if you can't feel our pain quote unquote um at least recognize that what your discomfort is and do something productive with it uh instead of brushing it under the carpet and waiting for all of this to go away no and and that's doubly ironic because in the world that we are in it's the unfortunate fact that men make more of a difference to these things than women do so it's incumbent on men to speak up mm-hmm. which is therefore the dilemma i also face you know i was asked to write a piece about this for the hindu which i'll probably write tomorrow mm-hmm. uh and the dilemma i face is that men speaking out the danger you're in is you could be virtue signaling which we see a lot of or you could be making it about yourself suddenly which again men tend to do but, but it is I, about but it is about men yeah but it you know in you. a different way as if you're showing how compassionate you are and how enlightened you are and uh, so on and and that that's a danger you face but at the same time it's it's the men also have to speak up and i think a few have i think one of the conversations that i'd like to hear from men instead of you know for example when uh the entire thing had started and it started with someone from the comedy circuit sort of being um you know uh held accountable for a lot of his uh harassment what i would have liked to really hear is from other comedians exactly how they thought they were complicit and i think one of the issues with men when they do decide to speak about this is that we don't hear often enough of how they are holding themselves accountable and even now i feel like i see a lot of women doing this introspection you know the ways in which we have enabled environments that we feel in unsafe in enabled men who we are now recognizing have done many problematic things and what is it that we need to change to make this better because really what something like this is asking of all of us is to be better people is to be more kind more compassionate more considerate and that kind of goes against everything that we've been uh, you know societally or individually conditioned with and i think that that's incumbent on both men and women but even now 
along with the kind of trauma that reliving this kind of abuse brings with it and reading stories of it brings with it i still see more women at least thinking out loud about the ways in which they could have contributed and i feel like most of the men i am hearing from are either completely detached in the way that they're saying that we see that this is happening to you whereas this is happening to all of us you know when creating safer environments for all of us i really felt the truth of what you tweeted yesterday <laughs> yeah uh, could you repeat it i think it was something on the lines of you know women are going about their daily jobs they're grappling with anxiety and guilt they're collating these lists they're responding to legitimate criticisms of what's happening and on top of this they're all checking in on each other you know mm. like i think i've spoken to more women in the past 4 or 5 days than i had in months and i love it because they're all constantly checking in on whether you've eaten have you had enough water are you getting enough rest are you taking care of yourself switch off when you need to and i had a conversation with supriya right after i came to bombay and it was the first time i was actually speaking to someone about what had happened because i had been traveling for work and i just felt such a great amount of comfort and from men i just want so much as a you know how you doing I hope you're okay and I'm not even hearing that much and that for me personally is really frustrating um, I respect the silence of a lot of men I know who may be thinking about this deeply or who may feel uncomfortable or feel like it's not their place and I get why men feel like it's not their place to intrude on a conversation that women are having but without pointing fingers I also want to say that there is a certain kind of silence that is a complicity of its own and if it's the silence that means that you're waiting for something to blow over or that means that you can't condemn obviously unsavory behavior or that you can't condemn misconduct because you're thinking back to something you've done yourself and thinking oh boy now i really can't say i'm sorry about this because this is how i behave too uh then then you know there's work to be done over there as well going back to what nikita said about women talking more to each other and you know that kind of shared um, is this in that sense a watershed moment in the sense that earlier if something happened a woman felt she had no choice but to keep quiet let it pass get over it move on to the next moment but now they feel the solidarity and because other people are speaking up they feel that they can speak up uh, as well and suddenly if the you know one person accuses man x nine other people will feel emboldened by that and come out and and is that happening i think one way i would qualify that is that the number of women involved in this conversation is still very small oh. and that it's very stratified yeah um we've we we know that there are women in smaller towns who speak languages that aren't english who aren't upper caste or upper class uh have constraints that are unimaginable to those of us who are speaking up or participating or even just reaching out to each yeah. other Uh, to the second part of your question i'm because there's more data out in the environment now i think we can say that the conversation has broadened i don't know if this is wholesale different from how women spoke to each other the phrase the whisper network has come up very often in the last few days and that hints at this sort of unstructured um private way in which women spoke to each other warned each other off men or institutions that they knew to be problematic uh what i think has changed though is a new awareness of a pattern and i think an underlining of the fact that none of what happened to us or our friends was okay i can't tell you the number of times i have seen a story about a prominent man come out on twitter and think holy crap my friend told me the same thing about the same man uh except that instead of happening to her at a conference in goa it happened at a party in delhi so this is a pattern of misbehavior The difference is that when my friend told me the same story I felt bad for her I filed it away as a black mark against the man in question and I moved on and now I realize that uh, that it was far from an isolated incident and the patterns are becoming really clear to me and that I think shows me about the the breadth of the problem In fact before you guys got here my producer Swati was telling me about how there haven't been any me too from hindi journalism or right. language journalism right. or so on I think there are some regional journalists who are coming out uh and I think Supriya Sharma had a, a hmm. fairly interesting sort of insight hmm. on this which is that the kind of concerns that uh women in english language media were facing you know a few decades ago 
there are a lot of journalists in smaller cities and towns uh, who are still facing those concerns and i think like supriya was pointing out a i think i don't know if this is a watershed moment i think this was something that has been in the making for many months if not years now so for example even the idea of naming predators first came with losha or the list that raya kind of collated and some something Should that Should we introduce that list? Yeah sorry so there was basically raya sarkar who at that time i think was a law student mm. had put together a list of men in academia who are known to be predators based on complaints that she was receiving um and at that time the list had generated a lot of controversy and that's why i think there is a need to introspect on how we look at this particular moment as being unique because i'm not sure that it's unique i think it's broadened the scope in terms of the conversations that are happening but even that broadening should be i mean we should look at that broadening with some amount of skepticism because i think what had happened at that time was not very different from what is happening now in the methodology i mean here also there are women who are either choosing to put out their complaints or to navigate their complaints through women they trust and there are a number of women who on twitter who are doing the very hard work of kind of keeping track of complaints and putting them out where the complainants want anonymity raya was doing that as one person now neither of these um as i think make peace was pointing out on twitter neither of these can claim to be perfect but they were uh, in themselves movements that tell you about how broken the system is there is a statement about that as well and so i feel like raya kind of set that in motion and so for example even the radical uh, sort of empathy that we were discussing unfortunately at that time we didn't see and so th- clearly there's also still a lot of work for this very if you would call it a movement or this very space to do in terms of also becoming more inclusive can i ask something i've been wondering uh, there are many obvious reasons for why uh the list of shame as raya sarkar's list which came out last year was called got less sympathy and less attention than uh, the current wave of accusations uh i've been trying to think of why uh one of the reasons as many people have pointed out is that the degree of anonymity uh of the accusers in that case was um was somewhat deeper many of the accusers were not only anonymous but they they were also coming from positions of marginality they were you know juniors in academia they were students they were women who were entirely de- dependent on on men and on institutional power uh for the jobs and the and the work that they were doing um many people have pointed out that because raya sarkar is dalit there's an element of marginality uh and a lack of sympathy from upper caste women uh that's kind of hard coded into how uh they approached anything she did or said one of the details that i've been focused on is also that however is also the fact that the accused in this round of uh, allegations are just higher profile uh and i think there's a and because they're involved in the media and in the creative industries and because there's a degree of celebrity involved there that you know partha chatterji doesn't have for all his fame um this kind of becomes headline news in a way that the list of shame didn't i'm not trying to find excuses for why we're reacting now differently from the way we reacted then i have an observation slash follow up question to that i mean one reason could of course be just the nature of the industry is that was academy and this is media but one thing that has struck me now is that one of the things that drove the anger then from all of these women were that due process isn't working that's mm-hmm. why we have to do this and one of the things i've noticed about this current thing what has happened over the last week is that we actually see due process working in some cases i don't know whether it's as a consequence of that but business standard fire one reporter Hindustan Times made the political editor step down all india bakchod has been cancelled by hotstar uh, you know mami pulled films by rajat kapoor from their list mm. and uh, i know of various other organizations which are taking this kind of uh, action fairly seriously mm. and uh, not as tokenism but that's actually not necessarily due process right mm. because mm. the i think in fact the response to these mm. accusations versus the accusations that came earlier is on the institutions there was no reason for institutions to not put in place due process then mm. it was just easier because 
uh, the debate became fractured in a way that it became easy to delegitimize Raya's efforts. And I think it's also important to remember that at that point, this was one woman mm. who was also being blamed for all sorts of bizarre things mm. like uh, creating a void within feminists in India, etc., which I personally found rather strange. And uh, Lawrence Liang, for example, there was actually due process that got put in. And that's the one name I remember. I think there were at least, uh, there were multiple men that I remember in some institutions either did take actions, uh, action. Sadanand Menon, for example, is a very good example of someone who was on that list. The institute did not take any action. And finally, a survivor also who had, I think, contributed to the list uh, decided to come out and now we know that due process hasn't worked but I don't know if that's on the list itself or on the institutions and the way in which they chose to react then versus the way in which they are choosing to react now because even the scale of this is defined by our ready acceptance of this wave of allegations versus the list then and I think that's as much on us and the institutions more than you know just the people who are spearheading the efforts um and of course, I think there have also, I mean, we are now like we were discussing in day six. And, you know, there's also been, uh, for some reason, because of the kind of momentum that has been driven by, for example, institutions taking action or the fact that these are journalists we've read or or heard about. And also Tanushi Datta, I think, who kind of also set things in motion by talking about her experiences with Nana Patikar. Um, it has continued for longer. I'm just not sure if it's the nature of the original efforts themselves or also some of our own prejudices that caused one effort to, you know, really catch momentum while another just sort of got sidelined by all the criticism that was lobbed at it. I think it's absolutely clear that the failure of due process was what instigated Both. the list of shame yeah. in the first place. And I think most universities, with some exceptions, behaved shamefully uh, in light of those accusations refusing to treat them as forget about delegitimizing them they uh, you know they ignored them they called them ill-informed and vague I'm quoting ex exactly from what ACJ said in the case of Sadaran Menon who was a drunk faculty over there at the time uh, and who not only got the support of his institute but also of a lot of other influential women including feminists who put out a letter uh, saying that, uh, oh, you know, we should be more responsible about these sort of accusations. Well, yes, there is an infrastructure of responsibility, but it is, but it, it was entirely on the institutions who abdicated their role in that responsibility and forced uh, young women to to lash out, if you like, in the way they did. Uh, Raya and I think her, you know, people who supported her said very clearly that. Um, Look, oh, whatever happens, I mean, they were like, look, we're tired. And you should know that if, if you're entering the halls of academia, that if this guy is like has you on his radar, it's a problem for you. And I, you know, I, I respect that. I, I recognize, of course, that there's potential for abuse. And so did everybody involved. But uh, the Me Too movement from the very beginning, I think for over the last year, ever since the Weinstein story came out, has been anarchic in nature. And we've had to take it and roll with it. And for all those who were worried about false accusations, particularly as far as uh, academia were concerned, and I have to say this, for those who were worried about false accusations against male academics, like this was your chance to make due process work. If you were worried that the women had violated some kind of boundary, well, why didn't you let your institutional mechanisms do the work of clearing the names of the men you were concerned about? Very few people did that. And I mean, look, as a result, what we have now is men like Sadar and Menon named on a second list now with multiple accusations uh, of misconduct against him. And, you know, I'm I'm not sure I I feel like our focus should be on the abusers. But I also want to ask the women who publicly backed him to think about what they did and uh, and, and how they hampered the cause of justice. Sorry, I just realized that we misgendered Raya because the their preferred pronouns are there and them. Oh, sorry. So yeah. apologies for that on yeah. behalf of all of us. So I'm really sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah. Right, uh, we'll take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back and talk about anonymity. Hey everybody, it's another great week on IVM Podcast. Please make sure you're following us on social media. If you're not, we're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. 
Also, please do make sure that you give us a rating or a review for whatever show you enjoy. It's really helpful when we get those kinds of ratings. And also, please make sure that you spread the word about podcasting. That's something that I think is really, really important to the ecosystem, right? The more that you let people know that you're enjoying podcasts and what kind of podcasts you're enjoying, the more likely we are to get more and more people on board. This week on Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by ad man and author Ambi Parmesaran. Ambi talks about what he learned from the prominent people he has met and also how things will change in the advertising world in the light of the Me Too movement. On Crock Tales, listen to two standalone stories by Anand based on the concept of love, lust and relationships. On the Pragati podcast, Pawan and Hamsi talk to the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the News Minute, Dhanya Rajendran, about online journalism and building a digital news platform. On The Kinetic Living, Urmi spoke to Nikki Gupta, the owner of the Italian bistro Mia Cucina. Nikki shares her experience of training for the Mount Everest Base Camp and how it changed her perception towards fitness. This week, Anugra Srivastava from Small Case talks to Anupam about all-weather investing and why it's important to investors. And with that, let's continue on with the shows. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. My guests today are Supriya Nair and uh, Nikita Saxena. One of the issues that you brought up yourself with regard to the last list by Raya Sarkar was that more of those complaints were anonymous. And that's an objection that people have been raising even now. That, uh, you know, wh- what do you do about anonymous complaints? Anybody can make up anything and put it out there. I know that both that list and this current wave of allegations seems chaotic. But actually, if you think about it, it's there is a structure to it. In the last list, Raya, tremendous risk to themselves, um, became the conduit and the curator of these accusations. So because they were assuring you that they knew the identity of the accuser, they were in some sense doing what uh, we do in formal institutional settings as well, which is to protect the identity of an accuser in a complaint involving rape or sexual harassment. Uh, In this case... We have two or three uh, women on Twitter who, through whom these complaints are being aired an- anonymously in, when they are anonymous. And I think uh, the discourse has pretty quickly picked up um, and sensitized itself to good faith in all of these cases. Uh, they've, there are reasons for them to trust the women who are putting out these anonymous accounts. And I feel like while we're still evolving our sense of of objectivity in these cases, it's not entirely absent. In fact, it's almost happened in real time in the sense that, uh, you know, we've seen some of the fake allegations happening, but also uh, the ecosystem has evolved just within the last six days. And I also know that, okay, if I see like Ritu Purna's account at Masala Bai or Sandhya Menon's, I know I can trust them that they're verifying this themselves. So even if they put out something which is anonymous, they have in some way uh, given it credibility and verified it. So, you know, you can kind of trust those accounts. I mean, which I so, think was very much the case with Raya's list as well, because right. they were also doing very much the same work that I imagine people who are putting out Uh, complaints on Twitter right now are and I also sorry I think the the one thing that this uh, round of allegations has that the list of shame didn't though is uh, the abundance of screenshots so the sense that you have something that's not just a name on an excel sheet but also a story um, that you can see that someone has dm'd this person that offers you details that offers you texture I feel like psychologically that's made a difference to readers so, but does it worry you that people could jump on this bandwagon? Like over the weekend, for example, starting Sunday night, we you had a flurry of uh, clearly fake accounts by clear sock puppet handles, which were run by somebody's IT cell, put which were easily rebutted. But nevertheless, there is a worry that then people jump on the bandwagon, use a Me Too hashtag, make up anything they want. How do you, how do you deal with that? I'm waiting to see how the element of fake news evolves in this case. Uh, what you've described right now, because it's so clearly easily rebutted, makes it clear that just pulling up a couple of sock puppet accounts and deciding to point fingers at someone because you don't like them isn't necessarily going to work. Uh, Public trust is more nuanced than that. But I'm interested to think about what the future might hold, though, and how, how, as this conversation evolves... Uh, the sophistication of threats against um, people against whom someone might have an agenda also evolves. Also, I feel like we've kind of been through these concerns, again, 
just to go back to the list also is it the list of sexual harassers in academia or list of shame oh sorry i know it is the list of shame <laughs> <laughs> what's the distinction sorry i mean it's the same acronym <laughs> the same. Yeah, oh. i just am wondering what the full yeah. form is but it's called yeah, yeah it's called lo- hashtag lo- #losha yeah. when people uh-huh. talk about it amongst themselves so but i thought even with the list for example a lot of people at that time for various reasons uh known to them were saying that oh, we don't know if these complaints are actually legitimate because they're anonymized and at that time i remember that i knew some people who were far more uh, well versed with the world of academia than i was and you'd come back and you'd say oh okay this person is on the list too and it's of course we've heard stories about them mm. and even in this round like supriya was pointing out i feel like at least up until now of course um it's shocking the spectrum of men who seem to have uh, harmed women but i haven't seen anything that would worry me in terms of being if it were a fake allegation that to me has uh, matched up to you know the hype threats that we hear about destruction of reputations or um i mean i think we should prepare for efforts like that i'm yeah. just not sure what those efforts would look like yeah. and uh, but maybe there's someone sitting somewhere in some it cell uh frantically thinking up ways to get me to believe allegations against uh against a person i would otherwise rather trust um but it seems like a bit of a long shot at this point and a friend of mine whom i won't name because i haven't taken her permission obviously but she's an editor in a major newspaper mm-hmm. uh told me recently that when uh, the losha list came out uh she was against it because she was worried about due process and presumption of innocence and all of those factors but now she is saying she changed her mind now she is saying let there be collateral damage this needs to happen and i kind of agree with her but what do you, what do you guys feel about that what is the factor of collateral damage here? which is of course is something that men will stress on yeah we i'm an overstate in my opinion uh i think the problems remain with or without collateral damage because they're essentially moral so if you do worry about for example the presumption of innocence and you believe that the same principle that applies in a courtroom should apply in how we relate to each other in public life uh then that problem doesn't necessarily go away and i don't think these allegations or the previous ones uh change that uh but if you look at this as an opportunity to think about drawing distinctions between how institutions can and should process complaints the reforms that we want to make in culture and society simply by airing out these problems acknowledging that they're problems uh and you know did and discomforting some individuals in the process then uh you should see these as a good thing uh, i agree that it seems unfair uh, and i'm thinking right now particularly of a friend of mine who uh was not accused of abuse but who admitted to complicity in covering up an episode of abuse and has taken the hit for it professionally um while i have some sympathy for the fact that this one man has suffered for doing something that many men have done um i also recognize that that's that's where change begins um and because of one person taking the hit as i said um if it allows more people to introspect about uh about their own behavior and and to not make the same mistakes then then i'm prepared for that you know i mean women have been taking taking hits for for a very long time so i just to jump in but that last part to me is also something that i'm very curious about because one of the things that i've noticed tends to happen with the discourse is that we are still centering the men you know uh, the men who are going to be affected by the allegations made against them what kind of apologies they're putting out and i wonder what it would look like to center what the women have lost because i fear that the scale of that is so large that it's difficult to talk about it's not even comparable yeah what would reparations look like for example which is something i think that rega also pointed out but That's right. it's something that i am deeply interested in because i do think that what happens is that in these cases i mean you're talking about such a large volume of women who have been affected professionally personally mentally emotionally physically that we can't it's difficult for us to fathom what it would look like to start talking about what we do for those women i mean what does justice or what does some form of justice look like when you've suffered that much and one of the interesting aspects what we were beginning to talk about was men and what happens with collateral damage uh, for men which i think i'm kind of on board with what supriya is saying 
but for me i wonder when we can reach a point where we can start talking about what happens to the women who've come out and spoken um they i mean how how do we make up for all the lost time because Precisely. of I mean, what people talk about the careers of these accused people getting ruined but what about the women like you know vinta nanda for example whose career ended 19 years ago and uh, you know and how can you then show i mean w- one of the interesting things about this me to movement and maybe i'm being too optimistic about this but where i think it will work and where i think it will not work why are you laughing no. it's just <laughs> nice to hear someone <laughs> be optimistic about it hard coded cynics uh, women <laughs> yeah no i i tell you what i'm cynical about i'm 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 cynical that is necessarily going to get women justice for what has happened in the past mm. or that all, all of the people who have been predators or who have been complicit will be brought brought to account what i am optimistic about is that it will change the culture in the future in in just something as simple as even if men don't change the way they feel internally it changes the incentives for their behavior so now the next time you are uh, you know on a date pushing past someone after they say no for the first time or the next time you're cracking an inappropriate joke or putting your hand on someone's thigh you're going to think twice earlier you could get away with impunity because you were you know you were just being friendly it chilled out oh rangile mizaj ke mm-hmm. as uh, <laughs> Nikita had quoted in Pachauri's instance, and I really do think that's going to change. I think men have to think twice, even if they are thinking twice for the wrong reasons. Hey, what if I get exposed? Even if they're doing it for the wrong reasons, some of that behavior will surely change. Don't you think so? I also think that the behavior of women will change because now, when someone puts their hand on your thigh, instead of normalizing it and keeping your ke- keeping how shaken you feel or how bad you feel about it to yourself, you. hopefully you'll now think but he's not allowed to do that and react and react quicker and hopefully some of the stories that have taken 20 years to come out won't take 20 years to come exactly. out after this uh i i'm well i'm a pessimist of the intellect uh in this case but an optimist of the will uh, to quote gramshi uh one one of the things um that uh, nikita's excellent story i think crystallizes that is the truth about this culture is that that hashtag times up isn't so much a warning to men as i think it is uh, a call to women uh, and it's not a call to say that an era has ended but that our work has just begun uh, and the fight is going to be endless um you only have to read the pachori story to realize just why but hopefully this means more women realize that they have fellow combatants and they're not alone my worry would just be that are we also going to see more people calling out problematic behavior that they witness because i think the role of a witness in these cases and it doesn't necessarily have to be an act of physical transgression that you view but like we were talking about the culture of an office for example mm. we haven't even gotten into conversations about gender discrimination mm. uh with journalism for example the different kinds of stories and this I would like to believe is less true today than it was say 10 years ago but it is still very much a part of the truth which is uh, the kind of beats that one uh, tends to assign women to or um, the kind of very masculine understanding we have of being on the field uh, we haven't even begun to get into those conversations but even before that if we are to talk about a culture that's changing and we have to talk about women who feel more empowered to articulate the kind of discomfort we know we've been having for years i'm also hoping it means that we're able to help others articulate that discomfort as well because i think a large part of this silence is that we're told silence is status quo so doing something other than status quo feels strange Uh, so, for example, if Pachori was picking women up on their birthdays, that was something that everyone could see. And if no one spoke up, then I would think that real change would begin when they start recognizing that as problematic. Or, for example, if there was a man who I knew was very supportive of the complainant, but then started complaining to me about how he could not understand the women not speaking up about Pachori, because and I remember this verbatim that. men have families to look after so i get that they're worried about their jobs but these women they're just doing the job to buy makeup and it, the thought was quite violent from someone who was actually supporting a survivor of sexual harassment and i hope that along with behavior the idea that this is a problem for women to deal with also changes because it's a problem for all of us to deal with and it cannot be the onus of just 
uh, you know, the people uh, or from across various sections uh, who are oppressed trying to make it better because I don't think the work will get done then. Yeah, I think it's significant that in many of the industries where names have been named so far, uh, there's a sense that that a kind of open informality, a liberal workplace culture makes a place more humane, it makes it more personal, it allows for creative freedom of some sort. Uh, when in fact, all of these are encoded in patterns of domination that are very, very harmful to the people being dominated, most often women. Uh, we know that sexual harassment is actually a tool of that inequality, that it's normalized to such a degree that as much as um, paying women less or keeping them from promotions, um, just the simple act of humiliating them in a million different ways uh, you know, allows you to, well, exploit their labor ex or exploit them as laborers. Um, so if, if people are saying that, oh, this is going to end all kinds of human and personal interaction and it's not going to be the same and, you know, feminism is going to, like, segregate us by gender again uh, or even do the things you mentioned, which is to think twice about the kind of jokes that you're cracking in mixed company, which people will say, oh, that sounds so Edwardian. We used to do that, like, 100 years ago. You want to send us back to the past. Well, no, not necessarily. The, but the way to think about it is that if this ushers in a new era of more formal workplace relations, then our worry should not be that those formalities will constrain us. We should be happy that they will hopefully stamp out a kind of inequality that we have refused to acknowledge all this while, uh, and that they in turn will lead to new kinds of equality, uh, which leads to new kinds of freedom. I mean, I'd say that liberate us, not constrain us. And also men I also agree. diminish themselves, uh, you know, by being complicit in this. And, and you know, and I'd urge all my listeners to just uh, pick up their phone and look at whatever family WhatsApp groups they have. <laughs> and look at the last 20 memes or jokes that have been sent there. And tell me how many of them you feel you should object to. But actually don't because, hey, you know, why stir up the waters? And I mean, once you get into family systems, you're just talking a different kind of, uh, I think, you know, scale of harassment altogether. Because I was talking about this with one of the women journalists who has also been following what's happening online. And we were just talking about how all of us know or have experienced some discomfort at the hands of a male relative. Mm. Or, uh, you know, child abuse, which kind of usually uh, we don't talk about, especially if it comes out from extended family members, which is shockingly common. Yes. And to, uh, sorry to come back to the parallels with the Pachori story, but I remember one of the things that I did forget to mention is the other reason he made it so difficult for women to talk was because this idea that Terry is a family. Your workplace cannot be your family. It should not be compared to a family unit and if someone does that that's really problematic because a family has a patriarch and workplaces don't need patriarchs when you kind of start internalizing the idea that I cannot air my dirty laundry out in public I cannot bring a bad name to the workplace I'm with or I will be harming the cause of climate change which was an idea that a lot of these women were told uh, even after the complaint came out, I remember a horrible piece in The Guardian which tried to suggest that this was some sort of uh, climate sceptic controversy to bring the great man of climate change down. Mm. So when you start selling us the idea that, you know, we have to operate as a family, you're bringing in all the problems of a family unit to the workplace. And I find this, that this happens with smaller workplaces a lot, that solidarity somehow is supposed to extend itself to secret keeping, which is unhealthy for your workplace, for your employees, and, you know, just for the kind of culture you're developing there. Um, sorry, I kind of trailed off there. No, <laughs> no, no, that's a, that's a fantastic point. And if and you're I'm, a man or a woman who's left your family WhatsApp group, I congratulate yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of addicted to social media. I can't leave anything. All WhatsApp groups for me are like Hotel California. <laughs> It's also FOMO, right? <laughs> it totally is. What will I miss? The next <laughs> sexist meme. Uh, I, Nikita, I also wanted to elaborate on something you mentioned before the show started, which is that some fields, some professions are structurally more conducive to uh, this kind of behavior. I mean, so I can speak for my experience and I, I'm recognizing that I also come from a lot of privilege. So I feel like it may 
even not be representative of actually how heartbreaking journalism as a field can be and i was working as a business reporter in bombay and i remember that at the time that i shifted to delhi because i wanted to pursue political journalism it was almost impossible for me to find an organization that would be willing to take my application seriously because it did not come from a network of patronage um most media organizations still very recently did not have open application systems and even now finding out where there is a vacancy finding out which person to meet how you can get the interview and being taken seriously inside the room where the interview is taking place is very much a function of knowing a person who can put a good word in for you i remember visiting at least six or seven organizations uh one of which was a leading newspaper where i remember being uh, asked as soon as i entered that i don't have journalism experience and how i would negotiate that in the newsroom and i remember being shocked because the first line on my resume was my journalism experience at the previous organization i'd worked with and for that i mean i do want to acknowledge the caravan because i feel like that process intensely rigorous as it is mm. at least gives you a sense that you're playing within a somewhat level field you know i was very grateful at that point because it's it's it it it, it, it is it is a long process the caravan hiring process but at least by the end of it i felt like i had a chance to be meeting different kinds of people and to give it my best shot and not be given 500 minutes or not be spoken impatiently to or being told that you know we'll get back to you and not being gotten back to and i remember that at the point that i entered the organization i thought that if this interview doesn't work out i should just figure out some other career to pursue because it's just becoming untenable and i will not be able to sustain financially like this and i think that because this network exists because we're told that it's important to be um seen with the right people to have your byline read by the right people um to be socializing with a certain kind of um hierarchy journalism lends itself to the secret keeping even more because a you have journalists who are doing great work who are heading great organizations that you do not want to um be antagonizing and because it is a structure within which the void between those entering the field and between those who are at the towering heights of the field us is so vast um that it's almost unthinkable that you're going to take that kind of machinery on and i think that it i'm sure it is true of a variety of other fields the reason it feels particularly hypocritical within journalism is because this is exactly the kind of uh you know idea of holding power accountable is what journalism sustains itself on but every day is a reiteration of those power structures being enforced within this uh you know field i don't i don't know if that no applause that's i mean you that last sentence very clearly articulated the problem with journalism uh i think the last few days of anything have shown us that journalism is as much about concealing facts and keeping secrets as it is about revealing them uh so there's a lot of work to be done for my part i think that every industry reinforces and reiterates its power structures quite brutally in different ways the particular way in which journalism and advertising and the entertainment industries do it is by enclosing us in this this sense of personal warmth and personal relations um everything everything is about having apprentices who in turn have gurus who in turn will give them work i was talking to a friend of mine who's trying to make a film who told me yesterday something we all know which is that it's it doesn't matter if you have the best story and the best script in the world if you don't have a big man opening a door for you that door's never going to open um and while all of this may seem like huge structural issues that have very little bearing on what's going on right now in uh women's dms um in fact they are precisely at the heart of what makes it so easy to exploit women and to keep them silent so on one hand the problem of access seems a gender neutral problem that men without access also face no, it no i think men time, get that wrong. access more easily yeah, i yeah, think that's what i was about to follow oh, up sorry sorry yeah, <laughs> yeah we please. both were just yeah. like no <laughs> no no no, 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 no. Sorry, please continue yeah please. so i said on one hand yeah. yeah but on the other hand the problem of access also perpetuates the existing gender balances because men are more likely to have that kind of access in the first place right oh that's i feel like that's 
exactly what locker room culture is about. And from everything that we're seeing in the United States right now, uh, it's grotesque that, uh, you know, just being in the right locker rooms can get you some of the most uh, powerful jobs in the land. Uh, these may not be completely obvious to us in how they operate in Indian business and politics, uh, maybe even sports. But we know that that's the truth. And I think just again, coming back to journalism as a field, for example, who gets mentored by whom? Or... Um, what kind of reporter do you see as being the person who can just get to the story that is, you know, that you need to get versus a reporter who's going to be more trouble on the field? And by more trouble, I mean, when women go, go on the field, there are different questions of safety, of comfort, of uh, and by comfort, I mean the level of comfort one shares with their sources or what kind of equation the sources are going to develop with you versus when it's a man. Mm. Essentially, we're also talking about organizations within which old boys clubs still exist or the idea that you could, uh, you know, you will step out for a drink and go to the press club. And that's when a lot of your networks and friendships are formed, uh, which are not necessarily spaces that are very friendly to women or young women. There are also a lot of tropes that move around in these fields, right? So it's not uncommon, for example, to hear from male journalists, oh, like it's easy for you to get access to this report or maybe you found it easier to cover this story and we know how that guy is with women I mean one heard this kind of vocabulary in newsrooms and has been hearing it for very long so you know you'd have to change that thinking too for it to become a more accessible space because if and I remember experiencing this particularly in television newsrooms where I would often wonder if the base idea is that this woman is able to get her uh, scoop before you are because she's a woman then when she does get discriminated against for being a woman why would she come and tell this office I mean it seems to create a prohibitive barrier to even speaking about discrimination or sexual harassment because if I'm being discriminated within the very space in which I'm supposed to report such instances um, then there's very little reason for me to have faith that these mechanisms will work um, it would be remiss of me not to point out that uh, Nikita's experiences and mine, um, while they represent a very particular set of challenges, in my experience, are nothing compared to what Dalit Bahujan and Adivasi journalists face in English language newsrooms. And we haven't even begun to talk about that, which is why, so if you've noticed, so many Dalit women on Twitter and elsewhere um, have said, while we stand in solidarity with victims, uh, you have to understand that you've made very little space in your movement for us. Yeah. Uh, and I, I understand that and I respect that. And and I, I think that's something we need to introspect about. Going back to you, and I'm just wondering if this becomes a kind of a vicious cycle here because you'd earlier said that women are not considered suitable for certain kinds of assignments. And at the same time, you brought up the sort of the accounting a woman has to do whenever she goes to report a story that what should I wear? Is it okay to have a drink with a guy in the evening if he's a source and blah, blah, blah. And editors can easily then use this to perpetuate the same problem and say, no, no, these are stories you cannot do. And these are stories only men can do. And it's just a vicious cycle. How do you break that? I mean, luckily, I haven't experienced that so far. At the current organization I'm with, I've been encouraged to go out on every kind of investigation possible. But I uh, can sense that there is a lot of hesitation among women to also bring up the gendered experiences we have because exactly like you're saying do I really want to reinforce the idea that it's tougher for me to be out on the field because that is true it's not untrue what I think needs to change is that institutions need to recognize it not as a problem but as uh, something that they need to work on together with their reporters uh, you know, for example, an instance that comes to mind is that it so happened that two of my male colleagues and I were reporting from the f same city in three successive months. Um, so by the time I reached there, both of them had already reported on their respective stories in the same city. And they had found a hotel that they thought was, con you know, relatively safe. And they had suggested the hotel to me. And I remember that the minute I entered the hotel and I shut the door to my room, I realized that it didn't have a latch. You know, and it could be opened with a key, uh, which any person in the hotel also would have access to. And I remember realizing that, of course, they didn't look for the latch. It's the first thing I look for when I enter a hotel room, because the first thought in my head is, I don't want anybody 
attempting to enter my room at night i don't i want to be able to let my guard down and it never is really down but i think even that minute difference in how you assess a room uh is different between men and women and i think it would do all of us well to recognize it and to be able to create spaces where we acknowledge it because only then can we even think about reaching a place where incidents that lead to less women on the field can be reduced i mean if we don't acknowledge it how can we address it uh and i think that is a problem right now women are worried about speaking out because you want to be able to get all the assignments um you know that all the men are getting as well and i realize that really small things help too so for example for me the knowledge that i can reach out to my editors at any point with any kind of problem i'm having on the field has greatly helped because i'm never told that a problem is too trivial to be brought to their notice and i don't know if all journalists have that uh, luxury you know of you're also relatively lucky to be working in the caravan which yeah, is relatively newer those cultures yeah. aren't there yeah. it's not like that and i think the caravan has put in its share of hard work in rethinking how power is uh, shaped and distributed so guys if i've taken enough of your time uh, today so i'd like to sort of end this by asking what seems almost a banal and cliched question but to all the people listening to this episode regardless of gender whether they are men or they are women is there something you'd like to say let's say someone who hasn't really been on twitter hasn't really followed it to the depth that we have and doesn't have the same understanding of it if anyone has violated your consent in the workplace or outside or has done something that you have normalized and justified to yourself as something that you deserve to have happened to you but that really wasn't please don't be afraid the fact that some women have been brave enough to speak out should be an impetus for everyone who has a story to tell and a viewpoint to share on the subject of sexual misconduct sexual harassment of this culture of patriarchal misbehavior that we've normalized for so long um now is your time because you will find solidarity that you have not previously found before if you are someone who is afraid that you are going to be accused or even falsely accused please don't be please understand that this is a moment of truth and that you have every right to participate in it as much as the rest of us i think i just i uh, center this on the women i feel like um i keep coming back to this but it has really hit me that it is astonishing how exhausting it is for all of us and if you're someone who's entering this space now there's a fair warning that it's cathartic and it's empowering but it's also very triggering and very exhausting so keep your support systems near you and you know don't forget to remember that it's okay to switch off when you want to because i think what we're looking at is also a collective sort of purge and it's as tough as it is um you know hopeful for all of us involved i think nikita and supriya thank you so much for coming on the scene and the unseen i learned a lot from you thank you thank very you. much amit Before I end this episode I want to play a clip from an earlier episode of the scene in the unseen 2 weeks ago we released an episode called metrics of empowerment in which my guests were devika kher nidhi gupta and hamsini hariharan when the me too moment broke last week hamsini decided to speak out against a man who had assaulted her a few years ago other women joined in and reached out to her and like many other brave and generous women online she became a fulcrum for those complaints sifting through them giving them comfort and helping them speak out and as she did this my mind went to that episode that ran with her just a week before that when i asked my guests whether they felt more hope or despair about the progress women in india were making devika and nidhi felt that things were moving in the right direction and they felt hope but hamsini said that she despaired she said it with a smile at the time and we all laughed but later when my producer swati sent me the recording of the episode and i heard it again i sat up straight in my chair when i heard her answer and wondered how i could have missed it at the time i've taken hamsini's permission to say this and i'd like to end this episode by playing her answer again i despair i mean <laughs> uh i do I, i'll tell you what um uh, a friend of mine and i were talking and he said you know if you could live in any century before this when would you live and i said are you crazy as a woman why would i want to live in any century before this this is the best time to live you know technologically uh than ever before um and if i had to live earlier as a woman it would simply be worse but just because our time now is better than earlier doesn't mean it's a good time to live just because we're more equal now than we were 20 years ago doesn't mean we're equal 
were not and this goes beyond equality in what i see as uh you may win this battle but you have to fight an other one the way i look at women's issues often is that you're just constantly fighting till you figure out what you want and how to get that and not worry about other things because your bandwidth as a human being is limited right and after a while you're just angry at the world for taking so much away from you um so i would like to believe in a world where we're moving towards parity but i also know that this is not something that will be achievable in any of our lifetimes If you enjoyed listening to the show do follow Supriya on Twitter at supriya n you can also follow Nikita at nikita1712 and do go over to her excellent magazine the caravan at caravanmagazine.in please subscribe support independent journalism you can follow me on Twitter at amit verma a m i t v a r m a and you can check out past episodes of the scene in the unseen at sceneunseen.in or thinkpragati.com thank you for listening It's AVM here. Let's go. We the AVM kids on the block over here. Just to talk, taking a break from producing all day, coming on this podcast cuz we got stuff to say. AVM Daily is the name of the show. Monday to Friday we ready to go. Talking about stuff in our head. We might even talk about our favorite bread. Signing out. It's IBM here, the podcast network that's in your ear. Catch IBM Daily Monday to Friday on the IBM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. Who said healthy food is boring? Who said raw veggies is just salads? Who said eating fats makes you fat? Look forward to my recommendations on healthy food and exercise hacks on the Kinetic Living podcast with me coach Urmi every Wednesday on the IBM app website and anywhere you get your podcast from